before we get into our lesson, first of all, there is a box in the foyer for uh, donations for the fire department, and uh, I will be gathering those up. I forgot my headpiece. I'll be gathering those up tonight and taking them uh, to the department tomorrow. So if uh, you uh, want to donate anything, you'll do that tonight. Also, immediately following services, we'll have a fellowship of leftovers from last night. So if uh, uh, you would like to stay for that, we would encourage you to, a little bit more fellowship. And this bunch does like to fellowship. Okay. What do all these have in common? Noah, Abram, all the earth, and David. They all have one thing in common. That one thing is God established a covenant with them. Of course, Noah had the covenant about God not destroying the earth anymore with water. The earth had a covenant with God almost from the very beginning. In Romans 8, we see that uh, uh, it awaits the uh, second coming for its, its uh, relief. Abram had the two covenants, so actually uh, one covenant based on two promises, and that is the national promise of a great people, a great nation, and then the international promise of all nations. And of course, David. David's, David's uh, covenant was that his throne would last forever. Now, we're going to talk about tonight our one sermon, one word sermon, is covenant. Covenant. And we're going to talk about covenant. Now, you can probably see or tell from what we said a moment ago that covenants really were based on promises. God's promise to these individuals in the earth. And uh, so the covenant goes with the promise. So we're going to look at these covenants in just a minute. The English word comes from two Latin words that mean to come together. Two parties come together and they can make an agreement or a covenant. In the Hebrew, the word bereath means to cut. It's a cutting or a compact that is made by passing between pieces of flesh. That's how they made these covenants in the Hebrew. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. And we'll see that illustrated in Genesis 15, 18. In the Greek, diatheke, covenant, is a testimony or will. They, these words are used interchangeably throughout the book of Hebrews. And either word will, will suffice. It will go uh, with the others. God's covenant to Abraham was based on His promise. Genesis 15, verse 3. Then Abraham said, or Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven. Count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. In verse 8, And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? Now this sets up the covenant. You've got the promise, and now you're going to have the covenant. God told Abraham, Abraham to go get a heifer of three years old, get a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, a pigeon, and a dove. 
and to cut in half the heifer, the ram, and the she-goat. And then divide their portions. Now, to show that they were in agreement to the terms of the covenant, they would walk through the middle of those pieces of flesh, thus establishing a covenant. That's exactly what God does. Now normally, as I mentioned, both parties walk through these pieces of flesh. But when Abraham was sound asleep and evidently having a horrible night, God passed through as a smoking oven and a lit torch. He passed through on His own. Now, you have represented in these covenants is first of all, the parity. The parity is when both those that's going to be involved in the terms pass through these pieces of flesh. When they both do, they both agree on the terms. A unilateral covenant is what God did. He set up the terms and expected man to be obedient to those terms. And he walked through. So this was a, an agreement that is put forth by one person. And the other person has to uh, follow that, uh, that, uh, the wills of that one that passed through by itself. That's a unilateral covenant. That's what God did. It's what God always does. God doesn't need any help. And by the way, God doesn't need our agreement when it comes to these covenants. And He did it on His own. He determined the terms and stipulations. In Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah in prophecy talks about the future. That there is going to be two covenants. The first covenant that was already in existence, the covenant that we always call the Law of Moses, was written on stone. In Galatians 3 verse 19, the question was asked, well, what serves the law? Paul said it was added because of transgressions. And it was a schoolmaster verses 24 and 25, to bring us to Christ. And it did not annul the promise that was made through Abraham. Now, Galatians 3 is a very significant chapter in the Bible when it comes to these covenants, especially the first covenant. Don't you do it. Let's see if I can get before it kicks me off. It did not annul. In other words, it didn't take the place. It was almost as if the Jews thought that when the law came, it took place of the promise. Or it was the promise. Paul assures them that's not the case. The promise is that one, the seed of Abraham would come. And the law didn't annul that. In fact, it came because of the sins of the people. They were about to destroy themselves. So for their transgressions, the law was, was uh, in place. Then he talks about the new covenant. He said it will be written on the heart. We also can find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Like a letter written on the heart, not on stone. As a result of this covenant, God will be our God. We will be His people. We will be God's possession. Lastly, through this covenant, we enjoy the forgiveness of sins. What the first covenant could not do, the second covenant will do. The old covenant was perfect. 
That's the problem. We couldn't keep it. We could not keep the old covenant. He said if there was a covenant or, or if there was any kind of faith or salvation that would come from the law, it would be the law of Moses because it was perfect. Romans 3. But man couldn't keep it. Try as he may. There's only one individual that ever kept the law, and that was Jesus Christ. We couldn't keep it. Moses couldn't even keep it. Hebrews 8 verse 13, in that he says a new covenant, he has made the first covenant. Now what's the first covenant? The law of Moses. It's what we've already established. He's making the first covenant obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Colossians 2 verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of, or, of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What is those handwriting of requirements? It's the same thing that was written on stone. It's the law. Ephesians 2 verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments. Now, it don't get any plainer than that. Contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Now, what happens is, when the first is done away, the second takes over, and the Jews and the Gentiles come together to make one man. That was the mystery of all ages in chapter 3 of Ephesians. That salvation and justification was going to come through or to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. And that they would be one people. One new man from two, thus making peace. It got better. Hebrews 7 verse 19 the new covenant is a better hope. You know, Peter tells us that the old law, the prophecies and the prophets only, had, only could look forward to what was taking place. They couldn't see it. They wouldn't see it. Even the angels desired to look into it. But now that the Christ, which is our high priest, has come. We are now recipients of a better hope. The hope they had was different. They did all they could do. But that wasn't going to be enough until Christ come. Looking back, you see, we now are participants in a better hope, like Paul said. Or like the writer said. It is a better covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 6. It's better because it gives forgiveness of sins. As we saw in Jeremiah 8. Quoted in Hebrews 8. Uh, Jeremiah 31 verse 8. In that the old law just simply rolled the sins forward year after year based on the sacrifices. But Jesus Christ was the sole sacrifice of this new covenant. And that makes it a better covenant. One sacrifice for all time. And 2,000 years later, we still can enjoy salvation based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Had the first been faultless, then there'd be no need for the second. The fault was that man couldn't keep it. It was built on better promises, Hebrews 8 verse 10. It promised the coming Messiah. Christ is coming. We get to celebrate that Christ came. They could only look for the coming of the king, the prince of peace. 
we look back at the installation of our king, at the Prince of Peace, and at the Savior of the church, of which we are part of. So we have better promises. And of course, the promise of eternal life. A better sacrifice. 923. Jesus Christ is that better sacrifice. What the blood of bulls and goats and heifers could not do, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ did. And that was to purchase our sins. The blood of bulls and goats, that was all part of the first covenant. In the new covenant, it was the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In Exodus 24, verse 7, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. Now, again, you remember I said that when God walked through those pieces of flesh, He would set up the terms of agreement. And now the children of Israel are saying, we will do those things. We will obey Him. And Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So these, this agreement was solidified by the shedding of blood. I want you to use your imagination for just a minute. And I want you to think, for about 1,500 years, how many sacrifices was made in Jerusalem? How many blood sacrifices was made during that 1,500 year period of time? The blood was like a river flowing through there every year at the Day of Atonement. Multiply that over 1,500 years, and what do you have? But there was not one of those sacrifices, there is not one drop of that blood that could provide salvation from your sins. Not one. Not one sin was removed. I'm going to look at Matthew 26, 27 first, and then we'll look at Job 9. Matthew 26, 27. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is my blood shed for the remission of sins. When Jesus went on the cross, that blood was pouring out of His body. That was for the remission of your sins and my sins. And as I mentioned already, that was the perfect sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And yet the blood of bulls and goats was not enough. God sent forth His Son to be that perfect sacrifice. Two covenants cannot coexist. You know, I hear a lot in the religious world today about being obedient to the law of Moses or to the Ten Commandments. Some people have said that, well, the ceremonial aspect of the law or the uh, uh, religious aspect of the law has been done away but not the ceremonial. Ceremonial still I got it backwards. The ceremonial has been done away not the religious. In other words the Ten Commandments are still invoked. Of course folks the sacrifices were not ceremonial. They were part of the religious acts of that law. But they say the law, that they were done away with the ceremonial. It doesn't matter what, it's, what they say because notice, two covenants cannot coexist at all. Look at Hebrews 8.13. Hebrews 8.13. 
I'm jumping all over the uh, lessons that Joe's already presented, but uh, just a refresher course. Hebrews 8 and verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by none greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, miss, bless, that, that's verse chapter 6. I know that didn't sound right. Now I know where false doctrine comes from. The Bibles get stuck, I mean, the pages get stuck together. Do y'all remember the time I was going to read from Galatians and it wasn't in my Bible? Do y'all remember that? Boy, I was teaching false doctrine that night. It was just laying there on the floor. But anyway, I'll... 813. For I'll be merciful to the unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The first one is obsolete. It's in the point of vanishing away. Chapter 10 and verse 9. Then he said, watch this. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. What's the first he's talking about? The law. The first covenant. The first testament. He's taken that out of the way in order that he may establish the second. We're no longer under the first. It's been done away. We're now under the second, which is the law of Christ. The testament of Christ. By that will, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. The word will there, you remember what I said the uh, uh, Greek word was for testament and covenant? Diatheke? Same word here, the will. He's talking about the two wills. By that will, which is the second, we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Look at Job 9.32. Job 9.32. This is one of those wow moments. Look at the dilemma that Job finds himself. For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go forth to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. You see, he wanted audience with God, but then he says, God is not a man like I am. Who is going to negotiate between me and God? Who is going to be my mediator between me and God? There's no man on this earth that can mediate between God and man. Not even the priests. Not really. They could make known the will of God. But they did a bad job of trying to be a mediator between God and man. So, Job says, who may lay his hand on both? That was what a negotiator did, a mediator did. He would lay his hands on both parties to signify unity. Who could do that? God was already working to make that happen through the plan of salvation, through Jesus Christ, who is now our Best mediator. Hebrews 9 verse 12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood, He entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
It's not through the blood of bulls and goats, but with the blood of Christ. He has entered into the most holy place. If you follow the symbolism, most holy place is heaven. That's where Jesus is now. And He's there mediating for us. He is a mediator that Job needed. And now we have Him. We have Him as a go-between us and God. By the way, side note here. The word sprinkling there, do you see it? Sprinkling the unclean. That word sprinkling there is a, is a Greek word rantidzo. Now the reason why I tell you that is that word is never used for baptism or for remission of sins. That's the word baptizo. As you, we all know that word. But rantizo is a whole totally different word and it's never used with remission of sins. Ever. Only baptism. Not sprinkling. Hebrews 13 verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You see, once this covenant has come into place... It's everlasting. It's eternal. It stands as long as this earth stands. And as a result of our agreement. By the way, when we are baptized, we are committing to that promise and the covenant of God. We're committing to it. So as we're baptized into Christ and we put on Christ in baptism, we're telling God that we are committing our lives to Him. Our service to Him. Our time to Him. We're solidifying that promise. And we're in agreement with His terms. I know that tonight for... A lot of this is nothing but uh, repetition, a reminder. But I would have you to know that we are only under one covenant, and it's the new covenant. It's not Moses' covenant. That covenant was made obsolete and has been done away with. We're under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. That covenant which was purchased by His blood. God arranged this covenant. And by the way, God arranged the terms of this covenant. Which involves our hearing of the Word, Romans 10. Our believing, Romans 10. Confessing, Romans 10. Our repentance, Luke 13, 3. And our baptism, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16, 1 Peter 3, 21. That's the terms of agreement for God's new covenant. So that when we do these things, we have as I've already said, committed to those terms and committed ourselves to that covenant and those promises. If you haven't done it, you're still uncommitted. If you haven't done it, if you haven't become a Christian, then you have not agreed to those promises. I'd encourage you to think about this tonight. Don't go to sleep until you've thought about it. If we can help you with any decision you need to make tonight, if it's to become a Christian, then we can help you with that. If it's to help you to be more committed, because God will hold us accountable to our 
joint participation in the covenant. We'll be held accountable in the last day. If we can help you with any decision you have to make, we encourage you to come as we stand and sing together.